from our archives, the Billy Graham Classics. Now tonight, I want you to turn with me to the third chapter of Daniel. Now at this time, Nebuchadnezzar was the king of Babylon, and he was the greatest of all the kings probably that ever lived. And he conquered Jerusalem, and he takes some Jewish captives among the young men, many of them in their middle or late teens. They were scientifically inclined. He takes them back to Babylon to train them to help him as he builds his empire very much like the Soviets and the Americans after World War II. They took German scientists. I remember one of them was Werner von Braun, who made a great contribution to the American military power. And I remember sitting with uh, Werner von Braun not long before he died. We were at a banquet in Los Angeles at the Century Plaza Hotel. And my wife and I happened to be at the table with him, and we'd known him quite a long time. And he told us how, intellectually, he had come to believe in Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior, not just by faith alone, but he became convinced that there was a God, and that drove him to study the Bible and the New Testament, and he came to know Christ as his Savior. Now, among the captives of Nebuchadnezzar, there were a number of top young Jewish men. Four of them are named in this passage, Daniel, Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego. And they were disciplined in all the ways of the Babylonians so that they could help as Nebuchadnezzar extended his empire to become the greatest empire in the world at that time. Now Daniel, Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego knew assertive discipline early because as we've already heard in the scripture that was read to us by John Wesley White, they refused to eat of the king's meat and drink of the king's wine because the king's meat had been offered to idols and they knew it was against the law of their God. Now, they were 1,500 miles from home. Who would know? Who would care? But they knew God was watching. And as young men, they dedicated themselves and they committed themselves totally to God. Now, Daniel had had a dream. And uh, he called in the astrologers and the soothsayers and the scientists and all the other people. And he said, tell me what the dream is. Nebuchadnezzar had, had the dream. And they said, well, tell us the dream. He said, I can't tell you the dream. I can't remember it, but it troubles me. Tell it to me. If you don't tell it to me, he said, I'm going to have you hacked to pieces. Well, boy, that really made them study and work and try to come up with the answer. But they said, we can't tell it to you unless you tell us the dream. We can't interpret it. And so Daniel called one of the guards over to him and he said, I can interpret the dream. God has revealed it to me. My God has. And he went to see Nebuchadnezzar and he said, don't kill all the astrologers and the soothsayers and the wise men of Babylon. I'll tell you the dream and I'll interpret it. He said, what you dreamed was the dream of a great statue. And it had a gold head and its breast and its arms were made of silver and its thighs and stomach were made of brass. It had legs of iron and it had feet of clay mixed with iron or iron mixed with clay. And Nebuchadnezzar said, that's right, God has revealed it to you. Now, what is the interpretation? And so Daniel interpreted and said, you, sir, are the head of gold. You are the greatest empire, the greatest king that will ever live. And then it will decrease on down till the end of history. And then will come the stone cut out without hands and will crush the image and it will come tottering down. In other words, Daniel was being told by God, that all the empires of the world will someday fail and only the kingdom of God is going to survive. And that was that, but that's the second chapter. Now we come to the third chapter. There's another image. Nebuchadnezzar has become very powerful, very egotistical, as men of power often get. And so he decides he'll build a statue to himself, a big image, 99 feet high made of gold, and he calls thousands of his subjects from many of the countries of the Middle East to come on the plain of Dura. And there he says, I want, when you hear the trumpet sound and you hear the music play and you see the flags coming in and you see the marching of the soldiers, I want all of you to bow down and worship the image. And if you don't, I'm going to throw you into flames of fire and you'll be burned up. 
You see, false, false religion does not hesitate to use force. The Bible teaches that Satan is the god of this world. He's the prince and power of the air. He's the prince of this world. And he uses force to get people to believe strange things. And we're seeing force used by religious groups today all over the world as tensions are mounting on a scale so rapid that we cannot keep up with them. And we've seen even in the past few days things happening that we never dreamed would happen. But they are happening. And it seems that the world is rushing madly toward World War III, and World War III will be Armageddon. The four horsemen of the apocalypse are already riding. I can hear their hoofbeats. And unless we repent and turn to God, they're going to come with all of their war and their destruction and the starvation and the diseases and the death and the hell that they bring with them. He commands that they worship the image. But Christ also was asked to worship at the image. He was asked to bow down and worship the devil in Matthew 4. But Jesus didn't argue. He didn't debate. He said, it is written. All he did was to use the Word of God. That's the reason it's important to memorize passages in the Bible, because he just used it as a weapon. And he said, thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. God had said in the very first commandment of the Ten Commandments, thou shalt have no other gods before me. Jesus said in Matthew 6, no man can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and materialism at the same time. You have to choose. That's a choice that every person in this room will have to make. It's a choice that every person watching by television will have to make. It is a choice that every one of us has to make between bowing down to the things of this world that are evil and wrong and bowing down before the true and the living God. And the images that Satan calls upon young people to bow down to today, pride, lust, many other things. Daniel, Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego restrained their desires in situations of temptation. And they said, no, we will not bow down to the image. Now, Nebuchadnezzar could destroy the body, but not the soul. And Jesus warned about those who could destroy the body and the soul. In Matthew 10, he said, And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul. But fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. You have a body, but living inside of you is your soul, your spirit. That's the part of you that will live forever the part of you that remembers and the part of you that feels, the part of you that's the real you, will live forever. And Jesus said, fear the one that can destroy both body and soul. That's the devil. Because hell was created not for you, but for the devil and his angels. And if you persist in bowing to the images of this world and rejecting the true and the living God in your life, then you are going to follow the devil to hell. Now, to disobey God's commands is called spiritual and eternal death. Now, these three Hebrews did not bow down. They stood up. They were the only ones of the thousands that were there from the different languages and the nations and the ethnic backgrounds of the whole world of that day that came to bow before the image of Nebuchadnezzar. They stood stiff like this as ramrods. They wouldn't bow. And, of course, it was reported immediately to the emperor now, the alternates before them, they could have taken an alternate route. First, they could have bowed and avoid trouble. It would have compromised all that they believed in. They could have rationalized and said, it's our duty to obey the king. And that's our first duty. But they had a higher law. They had the Ten Commandments. They had God. And secondly, they could have said, it's just a matter of form. After all, religion is a matter of the heart. God knows that inwardly we're true to him, even though outwardly we'll bow down to the image. 
or they could have stayed indoors that day. That would have been cowardly. They had an opportunity to witness to thousands that day, and they took an opportunity to do it. Jesus said, He that loveth father and mother more than me is not worthy of me. The Bible says, If sinners entice thee, consent not. Follow not the multitude to do evil. Then they could have said, We're far from home. God doesn't expect us to live like we did in Jerusalem. Who'll know? Who'll see us? Or they could have said that they were under obligation to the king, and they were. He'd been very good to them. Or they could have refused to bow, which they did. They refused to bow. Choose you this day whom you will serve, says the Scripture. Who are you going to serve? The true and the living God? Or are you going to serve these things that the devil brings in your path? The images that he places for you to bow to, for you to give in to. Decision could not be put off. They had to make a decision. Then, when the heralds announced it, when the announcement was made, they had to make a decision. Just like some of you will have to make a decision tonight. You can't put it off. He that hardened his heart, being often reproved, shall suddenly be cut off, and that without remedy. God says, My spirit will not always strive with man. There comes a point beyond which you can go in which it is very difficult to return. And tonight, for many of you, this is the decision night. It's either yes or no. You say, well, it may be maybe. Some of you will try to straddle the fence and live in both worlds, but God doesn't allow that. Jesus will not compromise with you. He will not make it easier for you. He will not lower his standards. If he had lowered his standards, he wouldn't have gone to the cross. But he went to the cross and he died and he shed his blood for our sins. He rose again from the dead. He's coming back to rule this world someday. The gospel plan is all set. And God says you have to repent. You have to receive him by faith. You have to accept my son into your heart as Lord and Savior and let him rule your life if you're to enter my kingdom. Yes, they refuse to bow to the devil and give in to the devil. What if it does cost you a few pleasures in order to save your soul? Would it not be better to be thrown into the fiery furnace here than to have both body and soul cast into hell forever? And when your trial comes, and it will, if you're a true, born-again Christian, if you're following Christ, you're going to be tried and tempted and shaken as you've never been before. When it comes, act in the light of eternity. Do not judge the situation by the king's threat or by the heat of the burning fiery furnace, but by the everlasting God and the eternal life which awaits you. Don't let the music of this world fascinate you. Don't let the drum beats cause you to march to the drum beats of this world. March to another drumbeat that the world cannot hear, the drumbeat from heaven. March by the steps ordered by the Holy Spirit and set by the example of Jesus Christ. And if you want to make that commitment, you that are watching television, you'll see a tele uh, telephone number there. Pick up your phone and call that number. Somebody is there waiting to talk to you, to help you, to make that commitment and that decision right now. Some of you are feeling the pressures. Some of you are going through trials and tribulations and temptations which are too great for you and you need help, you need prayer, there's someone there that will pray for you. And if you dial and it's busy, call back several times. They'll be there all evening. These brave young men dared the rage of the infuriated tyrant. And because they saw him who is invisible and had respect unto the recompense of the reward, they believed. But the king gave them another chance. Now, after this life is over, the Bible does not promise that you'll have another chance. No place in the Bible do I find where you're going to have a second chance. The moment you die, that's it. But the king gave them another chance. He gave them another opportunity. And they answered, tremendous answer. Oh, Nebuchadnezzar, they said, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. If it be so that our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, then he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. But if not, if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which you have set up. 
They didn't know that God would ever deliver them. They did not cringe and say, we beseech thee, please, Nebuchadnezzar, don't throw us in. Your majesty, don't. Think it over, sir. We can't disobey God, but we don't want to disobey you either. And they did not say, let's have a consultation and come to terms. And they went into this terrible furnace, and the men that threw them in were burned up. That's how hot it was. They said to God, thy will be done. And God says, be thou faithful unto death, and I will give you a crown of life. It was only after their decision, they made a decision, after they made their decision, it was then that God intervened and delivered. He says, lo, I'm with you always. And when you have troubles and difficulties, he says, my grace is sufficient for you. And then the king looked into the furnace, standing back as far as he could so he wouldn't be burned up. He looked in and he was astonished at what he saw. What did he see? He said, I see four men, and the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. Three men had been thrown in. They should have been nothing but a crisp. They were bound. But he sees four men, and the fourth one is like unto the Son of God. God had either sent his angel there, or it was the Son of God himself that had come. God is with his people in the fiery furnace. He is with his people in times of temptation and trouble and trial. Nothing shall separate us from the love of God, says the Scriptures. They have no hurt. The Lord shall preserve thee. He shall preserve thy soul. For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are open unto their prayers but the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. And who is he that will harm you if ye be followers of that which is good? The way they walked into the fiery furnace, calm, self-possessed, joyful. Christ was with them. God was with them. Their bonds came off. And when the king ordered them taken out, they came walking out straight as a ramrod with their head high. Not even a hair of their head was singed. Their clothes, they'd gone in fully dressed. Their clothes didn't even have the smell of smoke on them. And the king bowed down before them, and he said, Your God is the true and the living God. And he ordered all the wise men and the soothsayers and the Chaldeans thrown into that furnace, and then he ordered that great crowd from all over the world to bow down to the true and the living God, and he destroyed the image that he'd built. And it changed Babylon because three young men dared stand alone, dared to die, dared to look death in the face and say, I believe. That's what Jesus Christ did. He stood before the cross. The cross was to be the next day. And that night on Gethsemane, he knelt down with his disciples and he prayed all night. And he sweat drops of blood. And he said, Lord, to his father, my father, not my will, but thine be done. If there's no other way to save the human race, if there's no other way to save Bill and Jim and Susie and Mary down yonder in 1983, I'll go to the cross. They deserve death. They've broken the law. They deserve judgment, and they deserve hell. But if you want me to, and if it's your will, I'll go and take their hell and their judgment in their place. So he stepped out the next day. They put a crown of thorns on him. Here he was, the Son of God, with 72,000 angels with drawn swords ready to come and deliver him and sweep this whole planet out of existence. He said, no, I love them. And then he took that cross on his back and staggered after they'd beaten him and his back was bleeding and they'd pulled his beard and his face was bleeding and they led him up Golgotha's Mount and there they put a spike in each hand and a spike through his feet and a spear in his side and he hung on the cross naked in front of a mass of people shouting, screaming at him. And he stayed there for you and for me.
He took it all alone on that cross for you so that you could have everlasting life. He took the furnace of hell for you so that you might be forgiven of your sins and when you die, go to heaven and have peace and joy here and now and have Christ with you through the Holy Spirit now, every day. You don't have to live one minute alone. Every problem, every difficulty that you face, He's there. He helps you in deciding who you're going to marry or what your vocation is going to be or what your life is going to be or help you in your studies or help you in your relationships with other people. He's there to help lift your burdens here and now. That's besides the life to come. He gives both life here and now and life to come, and it's all yours if you put your faith and confidence in Him. You say, well, what do I have to do? Three things. First, repent of your sins. How many of you here tonight could tell me what repentance is? You think you really know Christ, don't you? You go to church. You've been baptized. You've been to Sunday school. But you probably don't even know what repentance is. Repentance means change, the change of your mind, the change of your way of living. If when you came to Christ, your life didn't change dramatically over a period of time, then there's something wrong with that decision. If you have a doubt in your heart or mind that you're ready to meet God right now, you better settle it tonight and recommit your life to Christ and say, Lord, I need you. I was the leader of the young people in my church, but I really didn't know Christ in a personal way. And one night I found him. He found me and changed my life completely, and it was a totally different Billy Graham than the one that just went to church and led young people and told the elders of the church that I believed all the catechism and believed all those things. I did believe them with my head, but not my heart. My will had not been surrendered to the will of Christ. And then the second thing is by faith you receive him. The word faith means commitment. We've heard that word tonight, commitment. That means you totally surrender for the rest of your life to Jesus Christ, not only as Savior, but as Lord. You surrender your personal life, your body, your mind, everything to him. And then thirdly, you're willing to obey him and follow him and serve him. Three things, repent, believe, and the word believe is where we stumble because we do believe with our minds, but I'm talking about believing with everything you have, surrendering it all to him, and then obeying him, whatever the cost. The world or the furnace, which will it be? Because there is a judgment to come. And if you'll make that decision tonight, I'm going to ask you to get up out of your seat. We've seen several hundred every night do what I'm going to ask you to do. I'm going to ask you to get up out of your seat and come and stand in front of the platform and say by coming symbolically, I do repent of sin. I do receive Christ as best I know how. I will follow him with his help. I'm going to ask you to come and stand here, and after you've come, I'm going to say a word to you, have a prayer with you, and uh, we'll give you some literature to help you in your Christian life. It's a lifetime commitment to Jesus Christ. Quickly, you come. We're going to wait. As you can see, these hundreds responding here, we want you to take time to call that number now on your screen. Counselors are standing by. From our archives, the Billy Graham Classics. Now tonight, I want to speak on John's Gospel, the 11th chapter, the 25th verse. And Jesus is speaking to Martha. Lazarus has died, and Lazarus is in the tomb, and Jesus is trying to comfort Mary and Martha, the sisters of Lazarus. And here's what he says. Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. 
He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? And she saith unto him, Yea, Lord, I believe. I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, which should come into the world. You know, the Bible talks about three parts of us. The Bible says that we are built with three things. First, we have a body. Now, your body allows you to see people, to walk, to hear, to shake a hand, but the body can never make a friend. It is the soul and the personality that has the capacity to love a person and to have social relationships. And most of us don't like to go to funerals. We don't like to talk about death. And we in America have a great fear of death. And the Bible says in Hebrews, the second chapter, who through the fear of death were all their lifetime in bondage. The fear of death can hold you in bondage all your life, says the Bible. In Genesis 3:19, the Bible says, for dust thou art and unto dust thou shalt return. And in Genesis 5, it mentions this, it says this, and he died 11 times. You're going to die. Are you prepared to die? The scripture says, prepare to die. Prepare to meet God. It is appointed unto man once to die, and after that, the judgment. But Satan whispered to Adam and Eve and said, thou shalt not surely die. And he still uses the lie on you. You say somebody else is going to be killed in that automobile crash. It's going to be somebody else that's going to get pneumonia and die. It's going to be somebody else that gets cancer. It's somebody else that's going to have a heart attack. But one of these days, it'll be you. We look at our screens and we see motion pictures like Gable and Lombard or pictures on Marilyn Monroe. And we think that they're alive, or we even see former President Kennedy come back on the screen, or Martin Luther King come back on the screen, and somehow we get it in our minds that, that they're alive right now, just like that in the same old body, but they're not, they're dead. So the body dies. Everybody's body is going to die. Your body will go to the grave. The second part of us is called the soul. Sometimes we interchange it, soul and spirit. But I believe there's a difference between the soul and the spirit. But the soul, what is the soul? The soul can think, the soul can decide, the soul can desire. The soul can know, it can love, it can hate, it can react. To sum it up, the soul is that part of us that we call personality. Now, I have two dogs at home, German Shepherds. Highly trained dogs, I might add. One of them's trained to run when you come, and the other one's trained to growl or bite if necessary. But you know, I've noticed that those dogs, they have emotions, they grieve, they, wor they seem to worry if they're not fed in time, and they get angry and they love, and they each have their own personality. Because you see, a dog has a soul just like you did. The whole animal world has a soul. If animal has body and personality similar to humans, then what makes humans different? Have you ever thought of that? What makes you different than your dog? What makes you superior to an elephant? What makes you superior to any other animal? The third thing, the body, the soul, the animals have bodies, the animals have souls, but no animal has a spirit. The spirit is something that only humans have. Man possesses something in addition to his body and his soul that the animal does not have. He has the spirit, and the spirit is totally unique. The ability, you know what the spirit is? The spirit is the ability to know and to enjoy and to have fellowship with Almighty God, the God of the universe, the God that made the stars and the moon and the sun and the whole world. You, just little old you, 
can have fellowship with that mighty God because God gave you a spirit. You are a spirit. Your spirit lives in your body. You're born with that spirit, that ability to have fellowship with God. And the spirit makes even the lowest person in the whole world superior to the highest animal. Thus, the human race operates on three levels, physically with the body, socially with the soul, spiritually with the spirit. Now, the question is, what has happened to our spirits? The Bible says that our spirits are dead in sin and trespasses. We've rebelled against God and our spirits have been cut off from God and our spirits are dead. And the reason Jesus Christ came and died on the cross was to reconcile us to God. Sin has separated my spirit from God. I cannot fellowship with God. I cannot know God. I might study all my life theology and never find God. I might study philosophy all my life and never find God. I may be the most brilliant scientist in the world and never find God. Because something has become between my spirit and God, and that something is sin. And the Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You are a sinner. I am a sinner, separated from God. This is a planet in which all human beings are born separated from God. You can be physically alive, soulishly alive, but spiritually dead. The Bible says, she that liveth in pleasure is dead while she lives. There's a country western song this year that has an older cowboy singing to a younger one that's what needed is faster horses, younger women, older whiskey, and more money. And that's what the world is. Alive, but dead. Faster horses, alive, but dead. Very much like the man Jesus told about, who was a rich man, and he said, Soul, take thine ease, drink, and be merry. You've got many years. Build bigger barns. And God called him a fool and God killed him that night. And God said, thou fool. Many of you think that you have years and years and years and years. And you don't know that at this very moment, there is a point in a day that you are to meet God. And it may be this week. We never know. In this passage that I read, Lazarus, a person that Jesus loved very much and one of his closest friends, had died. And I watched the other night on television a replay of that magnificent picture of George Stevens, the greatest story ever told. And I thought one of the most dramatic scenes in the whole motion picture is when Lazarus is raised from the dead. And I thought of Lazarus as he was in that tomb. He'd been there for several days. And there are several things about him as I looked and thought about it. Lazarus didn't have any appetite. When he was alive, he got hungry regularly. But while he's dead, he doesn't have any appetite. And did you know if you're spiritually dead, your spirit is dead? You don't have any appetite for God. You don't have any appetite to read the scriptures and to have prayer and to talk about spiritual things. You're spiritually dead. You can go to church. Thousands of people today belong to the church that are spiritually dead. They don't really have any appetite for God, for fellowship with God. And the second thing about Lazarus I thought about was he, there was no activity. A spiritually dead person has no spiritual activity. They have much physical activity and social activity, but little activity on behalf of the kingdom of God. A few months ago, my wife and I went down to Guatemala with Luis Palau, who is here tonight. 
right after the earthquake. And we saw devastation on a scale we have never seen anywhere in the world. And our hearts ached for those people. And I said, by the grace of God, we're going to do all we can for the hungry and the needy and the hurting people of the world, whether they're at home or whether they're abroad. Activity for the kingdom of God. And then another thing about Lazarus, there was no awareness. He was not aware of his friends. Dead men don't love. Dead men don't see danger. Dead men are, are unmoved by hunger. Dead men don't weep. And then the fourth thing, he was blind. And the Bible says that we too are blind. We have spiritual blindness. Your spirit can be blind. The Bible says the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them that believe not. You are spiritually blind. And then the fifth thing about him was he smelled. He'd been dead for four days, and they said he already stinks. But you know what the Bible says? The Bible says all of our righteousness and our goodness that we try to pile up to please God smells in the sight of God. It's like filthy rags, the Scripture says in Isaiah 64, the sixth chapter. We're saved by grace through faith that not of ourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And then the sixth thing about Lazarus was he was bound. You know, the Oriental's method of embalming was one of the most effective the world has ever known. It consisted of endless wrappings. And yet you are alive tonight physically. You're alive as far as your social activity is concerned, but you are bound and spiritually dead. You're bound by habits and sin. Johnny Cash talked a moment ago about drugs and alcohol. And men are bound by the chain of habit, the lust and sin of drugs, the lust for money, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life, sex sin. All of that indicates spiritual deadness. Soulishly, you're alive. Physically, you're alive. But your spirit is dead toward God. Would you like to be made alive tonight? Totally, completely fulfilled? Totally alive? Spiritually? What can you do? Well, let's think, what can we do for Lazarus now? He's dead. Let's give him some food. They say, well, what we need to do is feed everybody. Jesus didn't feed everybody when he came. Do you know that? There are thousands of millions of hungry people in the world. We have compassion. We're to do what we can. But that does not bring about reconciliation with God. They have a deeper hunger, a deeper need to be met. And that's the need of reconciliation with God. You say, we'll give people better housing. That's all good. We ought to give people better housing, and I'm for everything that can give better housing to people in this country and people all over the world. But that doesn't bring back the spirit. The spirit is dead. Man has a deeper need. Man's greatest need is reconciliation with God, and that's what Christ came to do on the cross. You say, well, maybe they need more entertainment change their environment. You know, many intellectuals today, I notice, are growing uh, disillusioned with the whole human race. They're disillusioned because they fail to understand that the problem of the human race is a spiritual problem. The problem of the human race is not a soulish problem. The hu problem of the human race is not a physical problem. The problem of the human race is a spiritual problem. Man's spirit is separated from God. He hates, he lies, he cheats, he fights, he kills, he has war because his spirit is not right with God. So man needs to get his spirit straightened out with God. There's one great thing that a dead man needs. You know what it is? He needs life. And Jesus himself claims to be the life that spiritually dead men need. He said that the reason he came into the world was that he might give life more abundantly. He said, here's one of the greatest passages in all of literature. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. 
Now, if you were a dead person lying in a grave, wouldn't you like to hear that? I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. You believe in Jesus Christ. That means to commit to surrender your life to him, to receive him as your Lord and your Savior. And you can have spiritual life. In addition, the Bible says your body is someday going to be raised from the dead. You say, how can that be? I don't know how it can be. I only know that science says that no chemical is lost in the, in the world today. And the God that made it in the beginning can bring it together again. But your spirit will be joined to your body again in the future world if you know Jesus Christ. I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never, never, never die. Your spirit can be made alive and have fellowship with the God of the universe by believing in Jesus Christ. Now, that is essentially and basically what the gospel is all about, and that's why it's called good news to the world. That's what the word gospel means, good news. And it's good news to millions and billions of people who are dead toward God to say that there is a person that can give you spiritual life and change you and make you a new person. You don't get eternal life when you die. You get eternal life the moment you receive Christ. You can have fellowship with God through Bible reading, through prayer, through fellowship with other Christians. You have fellowship with God. Your spirit is alive. Your body may get tired. Your body may get hungry. Your body may be in prison. Your body may be destroyed by the scars of sin that have already taken place. But God will forgive the sin that came between you and God. He will help you and restore you in a thousand ways, but you've got to be willing to go all the way. You know why some people really never find God? They're not willing to go all the way. They want to go part way, third of the way, halfway three-quarters of the way, 90% of the way, 99% of the way. But Jesus won't accept you. He says it's all the way. That's the reason he said in that chapter we read last night, he said, I will not commit myself to you. You believe in me, but I don't believe in you. I know what's in your heart. I know what you're holding back. You've got to be willing to surrender all if you are to have eternal life. Then he turned and he asked Mary and Martha, he said, Believest thou this? And Martha answered and said, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God that should come into the world. And you know, Jesus did an interesting thing. He wept. And the shortest verse in the Bible is Jesus wept. Only three times did Jesus weep. He wept at the grave of Lazarus. He wept at Gethsemane the night before Calvary. And he wept over the city of Jerusalem when he saw that Jerusalem was rejecting him as the Savior. And he weeps tonight, I believe, over the great cities of America as he sees the great majority of the people ignoring him, going on in their spiritual deadness, like dancing on the Titanic before it hit the iceberg. And he weeps. There are millions tonight in the tomb of sin. There are thousands here tonight in the tomb of sin. You need to be awakened. Many of you are in the grip of an evil habit, too strong to break, worse than a living death. What was Jesus' answer? He went to the tomb and he said, Lazarus, come forth. Do you know why I believe Jesus wept? I don't believe Jesus wanted to call Lazarus back. Lazarus was already in heaven. I don't believe Lazarus wanted to come back. You get a person that has died and gone to heaven just for one minute and they see the glory of heaven. 
why you couldn't pay them enough money in all the world to get them to come back. You and I weep for them. They're not weeping. They're happy. Their spirits are happy in total fellowship with God and their friends and the reunion and the happiness that's taking place there. Jesus wept, I believe, because he didn't want to have to call Lazarus back, but in order for his credentials as the Messiah to be established, he was going to raise the dead. So he said, Lazarus, come forth. If he hadn't said the name Lazarus when he said, come forth, every person that had ever died in the history of the world would have come out of the grave. So he said, Lazarus, come forth. And Lazarus came forth. But Lazarus was still tied in the old clothes. Jesus said, loose him. Now you and I have to be loosed. After we come to Christ, we have to be loosed from our sins the things that bound us. We have to be set free. And there's many a person that says to me, Billy, I would like to come to Christ, but I don't think I could hold out. You're right. You can't hold out. But he'll hold you. And Johnny was telling us a moment ago about that verse in 1 Corinthians that he came across, and what a marvelous verse. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God will not allow you to be tempted above that which you're able to bear, but will with the temptation make a way to escape. And even I forgot it, Johnny, because the, there's a phrase there that says God is faithful. God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted. In other words, God makes a provision for your Christian life. He gives you the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit comes to live inside and gives you supernatural power to live a supernatural life. And your spirit is made alive and you have fellowship with God. I'm asking you tonight, will you receive Christ? Are you willing to go all the way with him and commit everything to him? Your mind your heart, your body, your friends, your family. And you would like to say tonight, I want my sins forgiven. I want to know I'm going to heaven. I want eternal life. I want Jesus to come into my heart tonight. I'm going to ask you to do something that we cannot do tonight. Every night, this stadium has been almost filled, not quite like it is tonight. And we put people on the floor tonight, and when we put you on the floor, we knew that we could not call people forward as we normally do. So I'm going to ask all of you that want to receive Christ, I want you to stand up where you are. We're not going to ask you to come forward. Just stand up where you are and stand there quietly and prayerfully and with bowed heads, and I'm going to ask every head bowed and every eye closed and everybody in an attitude of prayer, and tonight you want Christ in your heart. You want eternal life. Just stand up and keep standing all over the place, hundreds of you. Just stand up right now. And everyone in prayer. If you would like to commit your life to Jesus Christ, please call us right now toll-free at 1-877-772-4559. That's 1-877-772-4559. that are watching by television, you can make your commitment to Jesus Christ right where you are with these hundreds and perhaps thousands here 
that are making their commitment to Christ right now. You can say yes to Jesus Christ wherever you are. God help you to make that commitment right now. If you just prayed that prayer with my father or if you have any questions about a relationship with Jesus Christ, I would just call that number that is on the screen. There'll be someone there to talk with you, pray with you, and answer those questions. And remember, God loves you. Love my mom. 